Jeffrey and what drove her to an afternoon of mayhem in Washington that ended with her shot dead. Questions for authorities and her friends. She was all smiles, like she didn't have a kid in the world. CBS's Dan Revive says it all began yesterday with Carrie at the wheel of her Infinity Coupe trying to ram the barricades at the White House. At least five officers stood, guns drawn, but they didn't fire as she suddenly backed up, apparently hitting a police car behind. But when she sped away, they did open fire. She skillfully drove around an ornate fountain, a police car right behind her, then sped up Capitol Hill. There, a police car crashed into a heavy security barrier, and her car crashed. Witnesses heard more gunshots. People saw police taking away a small child. The one-year-old girl is okay. Carrie was shot and killed. Her mother says she had suffered from postpartum depression but had no history of violence. CBS News senior correspondent John Miller, a former FBI official, joins us. John, part of the investigation, I would think, will focus on the shots fired and how police handled this. Typically, police are trained not to shoot at a moving vehicle, usually because it's fairly ineffective and it can be extraordinarily dangerous. In this case, you have something where the vehicle had apparently tried to run the barrier at the White House and then had penetrated the the Capitol grounds and was trying to was trying to elude police um, and get close to these government buildings. So factoring into their thinking had to be, why is this car trying to get close to the Capitol after the White House? Is it a car bomb? Is this a terrorist attack? John, what do we know about the woman in this case? We know she was a 34-year-old new mother of a one-year-old girl. She worked as a dental hygienist in Stamford, Connecticut. Back in April of 2012, she had a fall. She fell down some stairs. She had a head injury. She was able to get a, a handicapped parking permit. And then there were complaints from the other doctors at the medical suite where the dentist's office was she worked about her using the handicap space. There was an argument over that that actually ended up in her getting fired. We learned that the Stanford police uh, were aware of her in terms of psychological issues. So the picture is still developing. John Miller, thanks. Capitol Police worked yesterday's chase with their pay in limbo as the partial government shutdown drags on. There's no hope it'll end anytime soon. Our team coverage of the shutdown and the impact begins live with CBS's Barry Bagnano. A shutdown is one thing, but the government in 13 days defaulting on its debt for the first time? This is a destabilizing event. What happens with markets when they don't know what's going on? Mm -hmm. They freak out. Says CBS News business analyst Jill Schlesinger. House Speaker John Boehner's office is reiterating that won't happen, and he reportedly has told fellow Republicans he'll cobble together a bipartisan coalition, if necessary, to raise the borrowing limit. It's a strategy that would anger hardline Tea Party conservatives who insist any deal must include Obamacare concessions by the White House. This is Peter Mayer at the White House. The budget standoff has forced President Obama to cancel what was left of an already curtailed trip to Asia. He'll miss summits in Indonesia and Brunei, where he was scheduled to meet with the leaders of Russia, China, Japan, and other countries. The White House says the cancellation is a setback to trade and job creation. It's also seen as a blow to the administration's outreach to Asia. The shutdown is also affecting the travel plans of many other people. CBS News correspondent Bill Whitaker reports from California's Joshua Tree National Park. Catherine Colella is a sales clerk at Nomad Ventures in the town of Joshua Tree. I'm really hoping that this shutdown will only last a week at most. The camping gear store earns one-third of its annual income in October and November, drawing up to 150 customers a day. And yesterday, mm-hmm. how many people did you have? Five. And if the shutdown lasts more than a week, five of the eight employees will be laid off. If we do not have the park open, I will be looking at staying home next week. Nationwide, park-dependent communities could lose $30 million a day. I'm Jim Crisula at Fort Bragg, North Carolina. This massive Army post is among the hardest hit by the government shutdown, with more than 7,000 civilian workers off the job. We still have not recovered from the furlough, and then to be hit with this, it's ridiculous. Tiffany Lawson on being furloughed after losing several days of pay during the summer sequester. It's worse because we didn't know it was coming. Many furloughed workers here fear the government shutdown won't end anytime soon.
Forecasters say Karen could hit the northern Gulf Coast this weekend as a tropical storm or perhaps a weak hurricane. Jack Bevan at the National Hurricane Center says its winds now top out at 60 miles an hour. Rainfall, we're looking at the potential for four to eight inches of rain near the uh, storm track and isolated totals of 12 inches that could cause some flooding. Forecasters say parts of the nation's midsection could be in for some rough weather today. A tornado damaged some homes yesterday in several towns in eastern Nebraska. Well, just days before his trial, the former city manager of Bell, California, has pleaded no contest to 69 corruption charges. Robert Rizzo and other city officials brought the city to the brink of bankruptcy with lavish salaries and spending. A co-defendant is still set to go on trial. Overseas, more than 200 are still missing after that migrant boat disaster off Sicily. 111 bodies have been recovered. Migration activist Simona Moscarelli. The divers have identified where the boat is, uh, and uh, apparently there are many, many dead bodies inside the boat. Pope Francis is on a pilgrimage to the Italian town of Assisi. He visited the tomb of his namesake, St. Francis, the 13th century friar who renounced wealth. A new Quinnipiac poll of American Catholics finds 60% support same-sex marriage and 68% agree with the Pope that the Church is too preoccupied with issues like abortion, contraception, and homosexuality. On the Health Watch this morning, a new study of older women finds a little foot power can do more than just get your body in shape. A moderately paced walk, about three mile an hour pace, can have a significant benefit to your breast cancer risk. Study author Alpa Patel of the American Cancer Society says women who walked an hour every day had a 14% less risk. It was 25% lower for more active women. Photographer Bill Epridge, a man who captured so much American history on film, has died. Here's CBS's Jim Chenevy. Epridge had a long career working for the likes of Time Magazine, Life Magazine, Sports Illustrated, and the National Geographic. He documented the arrival of the Beatles in the U.S. in 1964, covered the Olympics in Woodstock. Brother-in-law and former CBS News editor Roger Norum says there was one particular photo. His most famous iconic picture was that of the busboy looking up staring at the camera of Bill Epridge holding up Bobby Kennedy's head. The assassination of Bobby Kennedy. Epridge died at a hospital in Danbury, Connecticut. After a short illness, he was 75. Jim Chenevy, CBS News. Investment pros are going through all the details in Twitter's 800-page filing ahead of a much-anticipated initial public stock offering. Twitter reveals it generated $317 million in revenue last year. That's the Roundup, produced by Paul Ferry. I'm Steve Kaith, CBS News. Broward Sheriff's deputies arrest a man who they say has more pussy than he can handle. I'm Kathleen Corsa with that story coming up on Channel 6 Action News. Welcome back to Studio 26 on this Friday afternoon. As we roll on, we'll have uh, the Friday Funnies for you in just a moment with comedian Brian Regan. The song of the day, what's on TV tonight, what's popular on Twitter, speaking of the devil. And right now, though, it's time for News of the Weird, okay? Sounds like a winner to me, doesn't it? And it does to you, too. Otherwise, you wouldn't be here. Or, why are you here? Anyway, it's time for News of the Weird. And uh, I'll put this over in this pot, and pull this up, and hit the play button, and it goes like this. All right, and time for news of the weird on the fourth day of October, 2013. Obama's care. Let's try that again. Obamacare's phone number spells profanity. Seems the internet went wild yesterday when it was discovered that the 1-800 number for Obamacare, one typed out on a telephone keypad, spells profanity. I haven't tried this yet, but apparently it's true. The official number for the health care from the Health and Human Services is listed as, get this, 1-800-318-2596. That's 1-800-318-2596. On a dial pad, the number spells out the profanity, and pardon my language, but this is what it says. If you uh, translate it, it goes, 1-800-FUCK-YOU. All right, that's what it essentially says. Critics on uh, Obamacare took to Twitter and trend the hashtag Obamacare phone numbers. But it's 1-800-F-1-U-C-K-Y-O. 
Now, I don't know if that was deliberate or intentional, but given the government's tendency toward creating acronyms, I don't think it was a mistake or an accident. And to think that I defended Obamacare, I did not defend this. Anyway, that's the news of the weird for this Friday. All right. Well, it's time for the popular tweets of the day. So we'll get uh, Governor Rick Perry in here and uh, get him ready right after Benny rides on out of here. And if it sounds like I'm talking weird or shouting uh, or talking at a weird angle, I am trying to adjust my headphones so that it's not so loud. My volume control got locked into high position a while ago, and the only way I can know how to fix it is to log off and log back on. And I can't do that without losing everything that I've produced at this point. So bear with me. It's going to be a long end of the show. It's time to find out what's popular on the old tweeter. And you can always follow me on Twitter. Hello, computer. Just use the keyboard. The keyboard. How quaint. And here's what's popular on Twitter today. Uh, this pop this week, a Los Angeles jury determined that although AEG did indeed hire Dr. Conrad Murray, who's now serving a four-year involuntary manslaughter sentence for administering a, administering a lethal dose of propofol to Michael Jackson. The one-time doctor wasn't unfit or incompetent. That means AEG won't be forced to pay massive damages to Jackson's family, a sum that could have been more than $1 billion. Well, I've gone to uh, Twitter to see what people had to say, and here are some of the things that i found. The Redis Virus writes, Why is the Jackson family blaming everyone else for his death but him? Don't they have enough money already? Trish Kirk writes, Oh, my word, have the Jackson family lost the goose who laid the golden egg? Get a grip. He was hooked on drugs. Who would have refused him? Tony writes, now the Jackson, excuse me, now the Jacksons can busy themselves suing each other until they sue themselves right out of existence. And France, France of Feelers writes, too bad the Jackson family won't be profiting from Michael's death. Where, where were they when the, he was on the juice? Not much of a support system. Ouch. And that's today's tweet of the day. It's time now for the Friday Funnies. And this week pulled up one of my favorite comedians, uh, Brian Regan, and uh, talking about spelling bees. Remember those in grade school and so forth? Weren't they a lot of fun? Yeah. Nothing like a little bit of public humiliation to say that, I don't know how to spell that word. Well, we'll do that right now as soon as I remember what I did with the intro. So, where did it go? Oh, there it is. There's the intro. I hope this is the right one. Okay. And now, without further delay, here's the Friday Funnies. Prepare for stupidity. Pay attention to me, boy. I'm not just talking to hear my head roar. Spit out the golf ball. Waka waka. Who wants to hear a funny ass joke? That's what she said. <laughs> But you know where it all went wrong was the day they started the spelling bee. Because up until that day I was an idiot, but nobody else knew, you know? And the spelling bee day, you know, popped up. All right, kids, up against a wall. It's time for public humiliation. Spell a word wrong, sit down in front of your friends. You know, that's great for little egos. Hey, look at me, I'm a moron. I wasn't even close. I was using numbers and stuff. That's why I admired that kid who spelled it wrong on purpose so he could sit down, you know? He knew he wasn't going to win, so why stand there for three hours? First round, cat, K-A-T, I'm out of here. <laughs> then as he passed you, <laughs> I know there's two T's. <laughs> I remember my teacher asked me, Brian, what's the I before E roll? Oh. Um... I before E, always. What are you, an idiot, Brian? 
Well, apparently. <laughs> so she explains it. No, Brian, it's I before E, except after C. And when sounding like A is a neighboring way. And on weekends and holidays and all throughout May, and you'll always be wrong no matter what you say. <laughs> that's a hard rule. That's a, that's a rough rule. Plurals were hard too. Brian